So, like we said, my name is Patrick. It says right there, I'm an electrical engineer. I work for a company called Planet Labs. I was gonna tell you what electrical engineering is, but you've all been doing it today, right? Yes? Yes? Good, you were working with the Raspberry Pi. That's a lot like what I do as an electrical engineer. I have to plug parts in and get them working and turn things on and off when we need to. So, um, I'm gonna start off though, why would you want to become an electrical engineer? And I'll tell you why I wanted to become an electrical engineer. And that's when I wanted to, when I was trying to figure out my job and what I was gonna do, I thought, I like playing with Lego. I like building things. I want a job where I build things. I actually want a job where I build robots. You guys recognize these robots maybe? Maybe, no? Somebody? A name, somebody said yes. Can you name one of them? Go ahead, shout it. No, that's Big Dog right here. It runs around and carries things for people. And I thought, well, I know how to fix a bike. I know how to do all the mechanical things, right? I can do the mechanical things. I wanna know how to do the brains for robots. And that was electrical engineering. So I went to school. I learned to be an electrical engineer. I didn't actually end up working on robots. I work for a company called Planet Labs, and we make, we make engineers? No, we don't make engineers. <laughs> Spa oh, who says spaceships? Do you know us? Do you know about us already? You're guessing. You're just lucky guessing. Yes, we make spaceships. Planet Labs kind of gave it away. We make satellites. Everybody knows what a satellite is, right? Yes, good, satellites. Those are our satellites right there. They're about 200 miles up in space. Uh, to give you kind of a feel for where that is, that's about the width of the state of California. So not that far away. And they're traveling, we call it orbiting, when they're going around the planet. They're orbiting, they're going uh, five miles per second. That's pretty fast. That's about the distance from here to San Francisco in seven seconds. That's if there's no traffic on the freeway. You know, when, when there's traffic, it's two hours like the rest of us. And these are some older satellites. You guys have a feel for how big satellites are, right? Here's a couple, these aren't our satellites, but you can see people buy them. They're maybe the size of a car, size of a bus. That's about what you guys expect for satellites? Yeah? Yeah, that's some big science satellites. Our satellites are a little bit different. They're actually a lot smaller. The satellites we build, I've got a little model here. Oh, no, not quite that small. How small do you think? Guesses? The size of this thing. You think a satellite is this big? No? Is it bigger? Smaller? Smaller? You got your hands about like a piece of bread? That's what our satellite looks like. You were right. This is actually life size. We took satellites like this big and we shrunk it all down to this size. Do you know why we would do that? It costs less? That's close. Go ahead, shout answers. Don't lift your hand. It's faster? It doesn't, it's not faster. Is more efficient. Whoa, there's the big one right there. It's easier to launch into space. You can guess it costs a lot less to launch a little thing like this than a big thing like that. It's the same if you're shipping something, right? It's going to cost you a lot more money to deliver that than this one. And because we do that, we can send whole groups of them up. And then I was going to tell you. The really fun thing about working on space things is exactly that, is watching your stuff get launched. This is a rocket that has 26 of our satellites on it. 26 satellites, that's more satellites than most countries ever launch. And we're gonna do it in one launch. Do you guys wanna watch the launch with me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we don't absolutely have to, all right? We don't have to, but for safety reasons, I recommend we count down with them, all right? You ready? Want to give it a go? Two to two initiated. T minus ten seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Mission that brings sickness on its 
third CRS mission, the ISS. Got main engines at 108%. Avionics power nominal. nominal. And launch team, launch team, be advised, stay at your consoles. Everyone in the LCC, maintain your positions in your consoles. In the LCC, maintain positions at your console. So, that's not a joke, that's a real rocket. We really had 26 satellites on that, and it really blew up about eight seconds after it took off. How many, how many satellites do you think made it to space on that day? Yeah. Really easy question, good answer. <laughs> um, that was actually a pretty sad day for us, because that was a lot of satellites. We had a lot of hopes on those satellites, and clearly, I mean, that's about the highest they got, right? You can see them up there, maybe? Um, why did it blow up? What caused it to blow up? One of the engines fell apart, basically. And then when it fell apart, you can imagine that all of this rocket fuel was going through it, and then it just went everywhere. You saw it maybe early in the video. It kind of got extra flames, and it stopped going up and started coming down. That's because it wasn't controlling the fire anymore. But like I said, this was pretty sad. But what we did um, the next day, we, we didn't do any more work that day. But the next day, we got back to work and we said, OK, let's get it together. Let's get back to building and designing satellites because we're going to get on another rocket later. And this is what the satellites will eventually be doing. We have about 40 or 50 of them right now. We want to have 100 of them. And they're going to be all orbiting one after the other taking pictures of the Earth. You can see here, you can get a feel for how they cover the whole Earth. Our dream is to take pictures of the whole Earth every day. Every single day, a whole new photo of the entire surface of the Earth. Nobody does that right now because satellites are big and they cost a lot of money and you can only have one or two, so it's hard to get the whole Earth in it. Pardon me? If we have 100, we could put them all in a row like this and just kind of take pictures going straight down the line, get the whole Earth. And you can imagine, I think, I hope you can imagine, you can do lots of interesting things with pictures of the whole Earth, right? You want, what you got? Pardon me? Google Earth has a big picture of the Earth. It does. Um, but do you know how old those pictures are? Some of them are pretty old. Some of them are a couple months. Some of them are years old. And that's because that's the last time that a satellite decided to take those pictures. So you guys want to tell me some things you could do with pictures? Here's a hint. <laughs> Maybe just guess. Throw it out. Go ahead. Don't lift your hand. Google Earth. Yes, Google Earth already does it. Go ahead. Fire? Spying. Oh, yeah. We can't do spying, but some people definitely do spying. Anything else? Go ahead. Sorry, that was tracking something, something natural disasters? Detecting natural disasters? Yeah, all good ideas. Um, this is a bunch of farmland in Brazil, I think. And one thing we like to be able to do is to know when people are harvesting their food and have an idea of how much food there is being grown in an area. Because you can't go ask all the farmers. That's gonna, they're going to get very annoyed that you're always asking them, are you going to you know, harvest your crops today? So look at that. You guys see that same picture? See how many fields got harvested? If we're taking pictures every day, we can say, when did they get harvested? Oh, right between these two. We can also watch people moving around. Not people, but we can watch ships moving around. Do you guys see the ships coming in and out of port? Yeah, this is uh, six days apart. Three photos, six days apart. And you can keep track of who's in port, who's picking things up, who's dropping things off. Yeah. Why does one day have a dull look? 
Yeah, I think maybe it was a different time of day. Maybe that satellite, because we've got more than one satellite, right? So they might all be a little different, and they're just taking different. And you can see the tide moving, yeah. Does anybody want to tell me what you think you see here? Oh, you know. All right, let's, get, let's let somebody else guess then. Anybody want to guess? The Amazon. The Amazon? That's, yeah, actually pretty close. So this is all trees, all the green. It's pretty dark here. And that's a river. And do you know what all that is? Do you know? No. Sorry? Clouds? No, that's not clouds. Salt? It's not salt. Go ahead. Oh, uh, what? Um, logging areas? Pardon me? Places where people went logging? Logging? It's very close to logging. This is gold mining. This is gold mining. It's actually illegal gold mining because this is in a national park. And this is in Peru. And Peru, just like the United States, doesn't want people going into national parks and just digging them up to take things out of the ground, right? It's really bad for the environment. It's bad for the people who live downstream because these people, mining all the gold, they use all kinds of bad chemicals and just put it into the water. And you can imagine if you're downstream, you're not too happy about that, right? Can you guys imagine if your water from the tap just had mercury all of a sudden? That's pretty bad. So we took these photos and we saw this happening and we were like, hey, we got on the phone with Peru. We said, Peru, are these guys supposed to be there? They said, nope. They went in and kicked them all out. That's how we're trying to help the environment. So then we got, a couple months later, we got more photos. Same spot. Whoop. What do you see different? Shout it out. Shout it loud. Clouds, Clouds yep. Clouds. Anything else? There's less gold mining? There's more gold mining? Who says less? Hands up. Who says more? OK, we're pretty agreed there's more. Yeah. Yeah. You guys see all that? Yeah. Um, that's one thing we can do is we can pick up differences and we go tell the government of Peru, hey, did you get everybody? I don't think you got everybody. You should go find more people to kick out. And then one last example that I have, if you'll put up with me for that. Somebody said natural disasters earlier, right? This is a big landslide. This is city blocks long. And these are very dangerous. And when Red Cross comes in to help people in this situation, they really like having satellite photos. Because do you know when the last map was made of this place? I don't know. I don't know. Red Cross doesn't know. They don't know what's changed. They I mean, there's definitely not a landslide on the map, is there? So they can look at this and say, like, oh, look, there's, this is exactly what things look like yesterday. And here's what it looked like before the landslide and after. And they can do those comparisons. And we can show them that one big landslide, but they can also see, did we miss anything in those comparisons? OK, yeah, some of them changed green. So these are a little bit apart. Maybe they got a bit more rain. That, that's what causes landslides, right? But I think if you look in pink here, oh, there's other landslides we missed. Did you guys see those ones happen? Oh, now you see them. Right? Yeah. Um, and then, um, right, so there's other things happening. And then in yellow, maybe there's things that look like landslides. But if we go back, they're like, oh, no, they were already there. Right? You guys see that? See how it's already there? So we can also go back, because we have this photo from before things happened, and we can say, like, oh, those things didn't change. You don't need to rescue anybody there. Leave them alone. Don't waste your time. So how do we make these small satellites, how do we make them so small? We put a lot of things we want them to do, and we can't use the big satellites like they used to use, because that just costs way too much. Well, one way we do this, you guys know what this is on the left? Maybe? You guys hear old people ever talk about, like, oh, back in my day, computers were the size of a room. You guys have heard somebody say that? Maybe you saw some big computers downstairs? Maybe? Not really, OK. <laughs> Maybe you will later if you come back to the museum. Yeah? This computer is as tall as a fridge. 20 years ago, this was a really fast computer. We called them supercomputers. That's how fast they were. 
Do you guys recognize the thing on the right? It's a cell phone. iPhone specifically, yeah. Somebody knows exactly which model. I don't, but I'll take your word for it. So we call that, we call that a phone, but it's actually really more like a computer, right? Like it does everything that a computer does. It's small enough to get caught in the couch cushions and lost, but all the same, which of these two computers do you think is more powerful? Let's uh, take a vote, let's take a vote. This one right here, the one on the left. Who thinks it's more powerful? It's a supercomputer, guys. It's the size of a room. The one on the right. Oh my gosh, I can hold that in my hands and you think it's more powerful than the supercomputer. You guys are too smart for me right now, because that's right. It is faster, it's more powerful, and it costs less because all of the technology has advanced. And we're doing the same thing in satellites. So here is an older satellite. You guys get a feel for how big it is? Because there's people there, right? That looks like maybe a big van, a small bus. You guys already know how big my satellites are. But how many are in that picture? Can you count quickly? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Let's take a guess, take a guess. About 20, yeah, just about 20. And like, it looks like these people these guys could, it's about 20. I'll give you the answer, it's about 20. Um, stop arguing with me, I know what the picture is. These guys could pick them up two at a time and walk away with them if they wanted. That's how much things have changed. Part of it is the same technology, everything's getting smaller. Part of it is we build these differently. When they build big satellites, they're like, these can't fail, we have to be really careful. I'll take questions at the end, okay? Okay, okay well, I'll take comments at the end, okay? I have to get through it or I'm gonna take way too much time. And then, um, so we build these a little bit, uh, a little bit more like everyday electronics. You see all the gold and all the special stuff on this big satellite, we can't put that on, so we just put, you know, simpler things. But it still works, it still takes pictures. And as a team, they can do more than the big satellites can. And that's what our company does. And I'll tell you a little bit about what I do at my company. Some of you guys were already doing engineering, so I don't need to tell you that, you know, it's a lot of figuring things out. It's a lot of working puzzles out. Um, one half of my job is when we need something new. When we want to, maybe my teammate comes to me and they say, Patrick, we need to be able to figure out where our satellite is so that we know what we're taking pictures of. And they think, if we know where the stars are, just like people used to do on big ships, we can figure out where the satellite is. Can you give me a camera to look at the stars? And I thought, okay, well, let's go find a camera, let's take pictures, let's, how am I gonna send the pictures back to them and point out all the stars? And that's what I have to do. Or maybe they want more power to take more pictures. I'm like, well, where do I get more power on the satellite? I can't just, you know, plug it into a wall up there, right? So these are the type of problems they bring me, and I have to get all of the details worked out to solve those problems and to build something new for them to use. And so we can all work together as a team to have the satellite working. And then sometimes we go on the other end and something's broken. And who do you think has to fix broken things? Fixer. Well, meet, yeah, fixers. And fixers are engineers. Engineers are fixers. We definitely are. Sometimes we have spaceship captains. And that's an actual job we have at Planet Labs. We have spaceship captains. Their job is to control the satellites. And they'll come to me and they'll say, Patrick, it's not turning on. Yeah, somebody's laughing because they also do this. It's not turning on, why not? And I go, it's, all, it's up in space. It's 200 miles away, going five miles a second, guys. They're like, well, you gotta figure out why it's not turning on. And it's a, it's a big puzzle game. It's a puzzle game that nobody designed, but we're stuck playing. And it's a, the biggest puzzle game. It's like a detective mystery game all at the same time. And it's extremely, um, it's extremely rewarding and challenging at the same time. And these are the two big parts of engineering, for me at least, is you build new things, then you figure out why your new things aren't working anymore. But we do this and we try and try again, and eventually we get better at what we're doing. This is a picture of two different, this is actually two pictures. On the inside, yeah, they're two pictures of the same place at different times. That's what we do a lot. On the inside is a small picture taken by one of our old telescopes. And then on the outside is a new telescope. We thought the old small one would be good enough to take pictures of the whole world. And it would be. It would just take a lot more work. You can see how much bigger the photo is, right? 
But when we were working on the small one, we thought this is the best we're going to do. This is as good it's going to get as it's going to get. And then after we flew that and we had some more ideas and our optics engineers really worked at it, they made the bigger telescope. It takes the same amount of space. It's still the same satellite, just different lenses to give us better pictures. So by trying things and seeing where that leads us, we end up doing better than we thought we could before. This is something we do all through the engineering at Planet Labs. Does that word scare you guys? It doesn't? Wow. I'll, I'll admit to you, it scares me. Failure is a really scary thing. That rocket, that failed, and that was pretty scary. That cost a lot of people their satellites. So I'll tell you, when I was in college, I failed. All right? I failed a couple classes. I had to take them again. It wasn't easy for me. Um, some people, it looks like college is really easy. Uh, for me, it wasn't. It was very difficult. We had, I was an electrical engineer, I told you, but we also had aerospace engineers in our college. And these were the really smart people. They were super smart. They knew what was going on all the time. They were the people who were going to make satellites. And I thought I wasn't smart enough to do that. I thought maybe I wasn't even smart enough to be an engineer. Engineering is too hard for me. I, gotta, I have to quit. I almost quit out of college because I thought, this is, this is just not for me, guys. I can't do it. Um, I'm happy to tell you I didn't quit. I got very close, but I didn't. And that's important because I got some really cool jobs afterwards. Worked on really cool projects, met great people. You see some of the things I worked on. But what nobody told me then, and what I only sort of know now, is everybody in college felt that way. Everybody thought it was too hard. Nobody thought they would get through. We all thought we were ready to quit. But nobody wanted to admit to it, right? Um, I'm telling you, everybody thinks that they're not, up to, they're not up to the task that they've been given. And this is normal. And it's, um, so people think that they're not ready to do something, and then they give up. And then they think they're failures. And that's a really dangerous thought to think that because you miss something the first time, you're a failure. Because that's not it. Everybody makes mistakes the first time. Nobody gets things right the first time. That rocket didn't get things right the 20th time. Um, eventually, though, if you're only ever trying things once and judging how good you are, you're never going to think you're good at anything. You have to keep on trying past those failures. Like I said, everybody has trouble. Everybody does. Everybody. But Stephen Curry did not sink the first shot he took. I guarantee you. Steph Curry. I'm sorry. I'm from Canada. We say things differently. So it's the opposite of failure? It's a success. No, failure is not the opposite of failure. Good guess, though. So failure and success, they look very similar at the start. Right? You know how success starts? You try something and you don't make it. Everybody, I told you, everybody misses it the first time. The big difference is the second time you try something. All right? If you're going to be successful, the second time you try, you've learned from your first time and you'll make a different mistake. You'll still make a mistake, but you'll make a different one and you'll learn from your mistakes. And that way, you will become better and better and you'll keep on trying. And then someday you'll wake up and you're like, huh, I'm not making rookie mistakes at this anymore. That's because you're not a beginner. And it's not because you're better than anybody. And it's not because the people who aren't making rookie mistakes are better. It's just because you've run out of mistakes. You've made them all. You've learned from them. And now you're ready to be a, you know, intermediate. You're not an expert yet, but you're on your way because you're learning from the things you've done. And again, you think some people get it right the first time. You think you might think, if, if I come down and I work with you guys, I might get something right the first time. I'm not getting it right the first time. What you're seeing is you're seeing the 21st time. And you don't see the 20 times that I made it wrong before. And everybody, it's like this for everybody. I'm telling you, it's like this. If somebody is really good at something, it's because you didn't see all the times that they messed it up before. So in my career, engineers, this is true too. We're not perfect. We also make mistakes, but we make our mistakes early. 
if some things are really important that you get them right. You know this, right? Your big tests. I, uh, I ride a motorcycle. I really hope they got my helmet right. Because if they didn't, it's going to be a really bad day whenever I need to use it. But so those are things that are really important to get it right. But if you make mistakes early when it, when it doesn't matter, then you can learn from them and you can get things right when it counts. But what you have to do, stop worrying, get ready to make those mistakes, and just make them when it's safe to do that. That's how we do our designs. Our first satellites, they never flew because they weren't good enough, but we had to learn from that. We have big boxes back at the lab where it's just parts of satellites that are never going to fly because we're like, well, that was a good idea, but it's not good enough. So let's try again. Let's try again. And that's how we get to the really good satellites like we have now that are ready to take, like I said, a photo of the Earth every day. That's going to be 100 and something satellites. There are like three countries that have 100 satellites up there. We're a little company of uh, 200 people doing that. And then nobody else wants to admit to it. I'm telling you right now, I make mistakes. Everybody else here is making mistakes. It's normal. It's how you learn. If you don't believe me, some of you don't believe me. Some of you think everybody else is getting it perfect. Try an experiment, all right? Go to YouTube. I went to YouTube, and I was like, learn how, and look at all these things people want to teach me on YouTube. And if there's any of these things, learn how to do origami, I heard. Some people want to learn to juggle. I want to learn to juggle because I have no coordination. And it seems really impossible. I can barely catch a ball. But I don't know how to juggle three of them. But if you, I guarantee you, if you don't believe me, give yourself an hour someday, one hour on one day, where you want to learn something, and just decide, I'm going to make all mistakes this hour. Just one minute, OK? I'm just going to make all of the mistakes. And then you're not wasting your time, and there's no need to get worried about making those mistakes. Just go for it. Try it. Tell me how good you are at the end, OK? Because that's what we do as engineers. We also we just make the mistakes early, and then we're, we learn from them and do our best later on. That's, that's what I've got for slides. So thank you. Uh, if you guys want to ask me questions now, I'll stick around as long as you want, as long as Kate lets me stay on the stage. She might have to push me off. So you can yeah. ask me about. So I know that some of you have questions, so now's a great time. What kind of questions do you have for our amazing rock star? Wait. So, uh, how, how, do your, how does your company make money? How do we make money? That's a tricky question. We actually, so I said we make satellites. Do you think we sell satellites? That'd be a way to make money, right? We don't sell satellites. We sell the pictures the satellite takes. So maybe if Google Earth wants to be up to date every day, they'll buy from us. Maybe if farmers want to know how all the other farmers are growing their fields, they'll buy from us. We sell the photos the satellites take. Make sense? Um, how much would an image cost? How much would one image cost? How much you got? How much you got? You have a dollar? You've got one what? You've got a joke is what you've got, it sounds like. <laughs> so um, that's kind of complicated. How much would one image cost? I don't know. It's a lot of like, how many images do you want to buy in total? Maybe if you only want one image, I could just kind of like give it to you for free. I don't know. Yeah? Yeah, just one. How do you deal with debris? And with debris? Other things that hit, hit satellites. Ah. The, so the neat things about orbits is once something's in an orbit, it tends to stay in that orbit. So you do have to be careful about things from another orbit hitting you. But it's very predictable where everything is. And everybody up there, satellites are very expensive, so everybody works together to kind of keep their eyes open and just move a little bit to avoid each other. So, so far, we haven't hit anybody. Nobody's hit us. And we've got people on staff to keep their eyes out for this kind of stuff. So it's pretty safe right now. Somebody at the back. Oh, um, so what do you plan on, like, uh, what do you plan on using to power the satellites? Sorry, I'm going to have to have that again. What do I plan? On, well, how do you plan on powering the satellites? Are on you powering the satellites. You guys want to take a guess? We can't plug it in. 
Solar power, they're guessing. Solar power, uh-oh. I better not break it, right? Solar power, we call these wings. They don't flap like wings, but those give us all the power we need. We've got batteries inside, so we just point those at the sun when we need to get some power, store it up, and then use it up later. Somebody else here at the front, I think, Kate? Um, this is not a question. Okay. But here's something about the supercomputers you were talking about earlier. Yep. Well, what I heard is that the world's top supercomputer is only half as powerful as a mouse's brain, even though it takes up a million times more space. That, I would believe that. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's actually very interesting, is how well brains, people's brains and mouse's, mice brains have evolved, that even though we put all of our effort into it, the best supercomputers aren't, aren't quite that powerful. Um, I've got faith that someday, maybe somebody in this room is going to make more powerful computers. Yes? How, what do you launch the satellites with? We launch them with anybody who will launch us up. We don't make rockets, so we pay a company like that first rocket that you said. We don't pay them anymore because they didn't do too well for us. But we've been up on some Russian rockets, some American rockets. Uh, I can give you names if you want. The Soyuz, the Delta, that was the Antares. Anybody who we can give money to put our stuff into space, we're like, take them, please, send them to space. Um, how do you test the satellites? We, that's a tricky question. Because, I don't, do you guys know anywhere where you can go to get away from gravity? Water, water no. There's still gravity in the water. Heavy things still sink, right? That's, uh, I don't know anywhere else on Earth either. There's airplanes that can do it for a little bit, but those are very expensive. So we try and test as much, as many things that look like space. So we have a vacuum chamber, we have special big lights that look like, the, that act like the sun, and we have, uh, we can do temperature control to change the temper of the satellite. But at some point, at the end of the day, you just go, I think we're close enough. Let's send it to space and find out. And then that's where we do our real testing. Is we're up in space, we talk to them over the radio, and we see what's going on, and we learn from that for the next generation. Pardon me? Somebody on the satellite? Do you think somebody's on the satellite? I told you, this is life size. No, we talk to the satellite, not to a guy on the satellite. Sometimes I call the satellites little guys and girls, so maybe that's what I said. Yes. Oh, somebody. Yes. Oh, a volunteer. Yeah. Um, so after that rocket crashed, um, well, when was that? And how have you guys been recovering from that? Um, I'm curious if yep. the people who launched the rocket, are they responsible for compensating you guys for <laughs> that? Or were they insured? So, yeah. you're right. So you want to know about when, when the rocket crashed and how did we recover from that? That rocket crashed two Octobers ago. Um, and that was kind of a, the space industry is really weird. Everybody, it th everybody thinks it's just normal that a rocket blows up and then they, don't, they just take your money and walk away. Um, they didn't give us any money back. They said like, well, we put you on a rocket and it's fine. Give us a break. Our rocket blew up. We don't have money anymore. Um, so we, you can get insurance. Um, that's really just betting, right? Like that's like going to a casino. Uh, our policy was, our attitude is we make lots of them. If a few of them fail, if a whole rocket fall fails, we just try again later with more of them. That specifically, um, we worked with a company and 10 days later, we got two more satellites onto a SpaceX launch. So, so that we could, the big thing that we lost wasn't just the satellites, but we lost the chance to learn from those satellites. Right? We couldn't make the mistakes with them, they just burnt up. So we got two more quickly onto SpaceX. We've survived. <laughs> How do you bring the satellites down, like from space? How do we bring the satellites down from space? They are, there's a little, little bit of atmosphere, so there's a little bit of drag, and they basically slow down, and they get lower and lower, until they hit a lot of atmosphere, and then they burn up. And they never make it back to the ground. 
How much money did you lose from the cr rocket crash? From the how much money did we lose? I don't know what the number is. It's probably less than you're thinking. It's definitely more money than I've ever seen. Um, I think the whole rocket was in the 70 to 150 million dollars, but that was for the whole rocket and everybody else's satellites on it, not just us. I don't know how much we just lost. Okay. Uh, how much money? How much money does it cost to make one of those satellites? That's a very secret number. I wish I could tell you, I can't, okay? I, I can't even help you guess. It's, it's, so it's less than the big satellites. The big satellites are hundreds of millions or billions with a B. It's a lot less than that. It's more money than I have in my pocket. Three dollars. <laughs> About how much money does it cost to send all the satellites up to space in a rocket? To send all of them up. Um, I don't know exactly what our deal is. I know some companies offer, they say on their website how much it would cost. And it's somewhere between 100 to 300,000. 100,000 to 300,000 dollars for a satellite this size. I think we get special deals maybe. You know, how, like if you go to Costco and you buy a lot of something, you get a special deal. I think we get a deal like that. I don't know what the real number is, though. Close to the back. Um, so how many satellites do you have up in space right now? Right now, I want to say 40 or 50. We've had some that already came down. I think we've put a total of 80 up in space already, and some of them already came down. Uh, it's right here. Do you, do you build anything other than satellites? Do I what, sorry? Do you build anything other than satellites? Do I build anything other than satellites? I build a whole bunch of test equipment to test the satellites. We call them test jigs. Um, we build ground station equipment so that we can talk to the satellites and so that we can control, we can point the antennas talking to satellites. Before this, I had a job working on toys. I've had a job working on high-speed radios. Um, that's mostly what I've done. How long does it take to make a satellite? Do you want to know how long it takes to design, or once it's designed, to put it together? Both. Designing is an ongoing job. I, it was probably two years from when we started the first one, before I even joined, till it was built and ready to launch. Now, maybe every three or four months, we come up with a new version, building a lot on what we've done before. Actually putting one together, when I started at the company, I said, hey, I want a satellite to test things on my desk. And the people building satellites said, Patrick, we don't have time to build you a satellite. We have to build them to put them on that rocket. So that was a waste of time. But I asked them, can I build a satellite? Give me the instructions and the parts. They said, sure, do that. Have fun. It took me two days to put one together that wasn't going to space. It takes a bit longer if they're going to space because you have to test it, make sure it's all good. Right here. How many, do you build any different kinds of satellites other than that one? Do we build different kinds of satellites? Right now, we only build this one kind. We've built lots of versions of it as we learn more and get better. It's just, we've barely got our stuff together building this one. It takes all of our work to make this one good. So maybe once this one's really good, we can go think of the next satellite to build. Is there a question at the back? At the back? What is the lifespan of a satellite and how often do you retire your satellites? Lifespan, so he wants to know how long the satellites live in space. Live. They're not alive, but they last about two years because of their orbit. If we get into a bit higher orbit, we might get four years. Um, somebody asked me about debris before, about wreckage from the satellites. All of our orbits are designed to come down and re-enter in 20 years at the longest, just so that they're out of the way and not causing new debris. Something about this, it's an interesting question. People think this should last as long as you want, but some of our satellites, they went up three years ago. Do you guys know like where phones were three years ago? Yeah? And do you, want, do you still want that old three-year-old phone, or do you want a brand new phone now? Brand new one? If you want the best phone that's out there and the best cameras, you want the brand new ones. So we actually want our satellites to come down, get out of the way, so we can put more newer ones on it. There, one right here. Um, how many people does it take to design and build one satellite? To design and build one satellite. 
Building it is a team of maybe five people right now. Design work is, right now we're about 20, 25 people, but when the company started, the entire company, designing, building satellites, running the job, um, figuring out how we're gonna talk to the satellites was eight people, I think. If you really wanted to, you could probably build a satellite with one good electrical engineer, a good mechanical engineer, and one more person who knew everything else that had to go together. And a software engineer, oh, I'm already up to four. <laughs> so you can make it with small teams, you can make it with a bigger team. Kate has a question? Yeah. Or, oh, We've got one right here, sorry. Uh, what are the parts of that satellite? What are some parts? Uh, let's see if we can take guesses. You guys guessed solar panel already? You guys see into it here? So if a lens, yeah. It's like a telescope, basically. A telescope that looks down at the Earth. You guys want to guess what is out here? What's sticking out? Lens cap. Lens cap? Well, when it's folded, it's a lens cap. What's on the lens cap right here? Looks like a diving board. Antenna, somebody said? Yeah, that's an antenna to talk to the ground. So we've got, if you look at it from the side, whoops, this side is going to work better for you. About this much is basically a big lens. And then back here we have a camera. And then we have a computer on there, a radio to talk to the ground, a few other things, and some batteries. Those are most of the big parts. I think that's good. Want other questions? Over here. How fast does the satellite travel? How fast does it travel? I said five miles every second, right? It's not, there's no rockets on the satellite. So in orbit, like I said, it goes, once you're in orbit, it just keeps in that orbit. So once they start off, they're going five miles per second. Well, they stay at five miles per second right until they hit the atmosphere and burn up. Um, so earlier in the slides, you said there was two kind. You built two kinds of uh, telescopes. Is this the first one or the second one? This is a mock-up of the second one. This is not the actual telescope. We needed those to go to space, um, but. This is a mock-up of the second one. The first one fit in the same amount of space. So if you put all the sides on, you wouldn't, you wouldn't notice the difference. Yeah? How do you stabilize it? Um, short answer is reaction wheels and magnetic torquers. So have you guys been in a museum where they give you a wheel and you sit on a stool, they spin up the wheel, you turn the, you turn the wheel and then you spin on the stool? Some people have done that? Yeah, does, do, does everybody sort of know what I'm talking about? Maybe? No? You guys know how a top stays stable or a gyroscope stays stable? Because it's spinning, it keeps balance? Okay. So we have flywheels that's just a circular weight that's spinning. And then if we need the satellite to turn one way, we just get that wheel turning faster the other way. And that lets us point. We can point at the ground. We can point our solar panels at the sun. The other way that we do it is we have electromagnets. You guys all know that the Earth has a magnetic field, right? That's how a compass works, right? You guys all know this? You've seen this in science probably? Maybe. <laughs> so the Earth has a magnetic field. It's like a big magnet. And we have electromagnets that we can turn on and off, just like the LEDs, which we control them the same way as you did with the Raspberry Pi. We say, turn it on, and it turns on. And that aligns us with the magnetic field of the Earth. Those are our two big ways to point, to stabilize and control where we're pointing. We've got time for two more questions. So there's one at the back and one two more. here. You have a radio on the uh, satellite, but who is on the other side? Who's on the other side of the radio? We actually have three radios. We have one to go slow back and forth, one to go fast down, and one to go fast coming up. And who's on the other side is us again. I told you about making satellites. What I didn't tell you about is the rest of the company. There's a whole rest of the company. Uh, there's people who take all the pictures and make them all pretty and put them all together. But you're asking about the ground stations team. And we have ground stations in seven different countries, I think. Uh, four or five, at least five countries spread out around the earth with big antenna dishes. You've probably seen them around. If you go up 280, you can see a big antenna dish and they just point and track our satellites, and then our computers on the ground can talk to the satellites. One more. Since you're going so fast, how do you make the camera take pictures like that are not blurry? That are not blurry. You make them really short? 
<laughs> um, and you, that's really the biggest trick is you make them really short. These, the pictures that you saw, that whole frame is the ground we cover in one second. So if you make it just a fraction of a second and then you wait till you're lined up with the next one, you take a, a photo again, it's not so blurry. These ones are not blurry at all. The, the blur is down to just the size of one pixel, one dot on the photo. Make sense? Awesome. I th think we're out of time. All right, so I have one last question for you. Okay. And I'm so, I'm wondering, you've shared a lot of really great interesting stories and experiences with the students. And as you see, a lot of the students are really excited about the work you're doing. So what advice would you have for these students as they're moving forward in all of their interests, hobbies, mm. academic studies, and all of their future careers? Well, one thing I think you picked up from the, from the talk was it's really important to be ready to make mistakes and to not beat yourself up when you make them. Because I spent, I spent 20 years beating myself up because of mistakes because I thought I'm just not good enough. And it turns out, I, mean, like, I guess I kind of am good enough to build satellites, right? Um, but so be ready to make mistakes, be comfortable with it. And then otherwise, find the things you like and do those. And they might not be your first job, but eventually you might find something, or you will find something that you like doing with that. Or you'll find other things that you do like doing in your job that line up with your interests. I think those are the most important things. Great, thank you so much. You've been an incredible rock star. Big round of applause for amazing rock star Patrick. Thank you.